Yo guys, I'm back here to give you my reviews of both the TNA Hard Justice pay-per-view which took place last night from Impact Zone in Orlando, Florida, as well as Saturday night's uh, Strike Force card from the HP Pavilion in San Jose, California. You know, for TNA, I gotta say this is just an okay pay-per-view. You know, definitely better, obviously, than Victory Road 09, which was terrible. Uh, this one, you know, you had some good moments, some good matches, some dull matches, some stuff that went on too long. But you know what? In the long run, better than I thought it would be, really. I went in there with l very low expectations. Um, and I was, I will say, proven wrong. Which, some, like I keep saying, you know, sometimes it's good to go into a pay-per-view with no expectations because they get blown away. And uh, in this show, they were, I wouldn't say blown away, I guess, but they, I was put... Uh, uh, shocked at how decent the show was. Uh, with Strike Force, though, very enjoyable card. Um, only one fight goes past the first round, and that was the Ishida uh, Melendez fight, which was really good fight. I mean, it was just the same as their fight they had back on the New Year's Eve uh, show back in 2007. Basically, just the same. Only difference was, I think, because of Ishida's training only getting a couple weeks to train for it. But overall, this was a very enjoyable card. Um, the reaction to the Cyborg Corona fight, great stuff. Makes like That felt like a, a superstar fight. And you know what? I think that's really great there. Um, my question is, now who do you get to take on uh, Cyborg? I personally think Strikeforce needs to go after Terra La Rosa, but we will get to that in a minute or two as I will first of all review the TNA Hard Justice pay-per-view. We started things off with the escape match or escape the cage match. I think that's what they're calling it now anyway, which was uh, Suicide versus Daniels versus Consequences Creed versus The Amazing Red versus Chris Sabin versus Alex Shelley versus Jay Lethal and Pope D'Angelo De Niro, who was, of course, Elijah Burke. Now, my thing here was... You know, I don't like debuting guys on pay-per-view. And if I were TNA, I would have probably been like, you know, there will be a mystery man in this match. It may have added some more intrigue. Definitely wouldn't have added any more pay-per-view buys as not a lot of people buy pay-per-views from TNA. But I think it would have been just the smart thing to do. Um, that's how exactly I would have done it. Just said there will be a mystery man. And it was, of course, for the Pope, uh, D'Angelo De Niro. Really, this was just an exciting match from what you thought it would be, you know, I think maybe a better than average X Division match. I'll say that. Some really great spots. It was a spot fest match, so you can't say, well, it's a spot fest, so I hated it. It's a spot fest match. Um, my problem, of course, like most people's, is once again, TNA in the production truck fucking sucks. Keith Mitchell needs to be fired. I made mention of this. I, I don't know on how many TNA pay per views, but. Once again, especially in this match, and this is, I believe, the third one they've done, TNA has not got this match right. They miss the big spots, they don't film this match right, and one of the big things is do not use red on red ropes. That does not go good with the eye, and it's hard to follow the action. Make them aluminum colors or something. Don't go red on red. That's just not a good thing. Not a good thing for television. Red on red does not show well. Red in general on television does not show up uh, that well. Um, especially now when it's the contrasting of itself. Um, but yeah, like this said, uh, this match was a really good opener. A really, really good opener in my opinion. Um, you know, some great spots. Uh, I can remember a few, I believe. The, the, the coolest one I thought was when... It was Amazing Red, which is interesting enough, when he did basically what I thought was just going to be a Shining Wizard, but he turned it into a Hurricane Rana, and Consequences Creed just bounced his face off the mat. I thought that was pretty cool. They did a number of Tower of Doom spots, some cool ones, and I thought when they were going to do the big, big Tower of Doom, they uh, skipped past that one, which was nice to see. Um, the other cool spot I thought was when Shelly hit an overhead belly-to-belly -belly suplex on Suicide, who was charging in, who flew into the Pope. And, you know, Elijah Burke sold so well in this match. A lot of guys are just like, ow, oh, oh, and they flop around. And then they get up in two seconds and go back to, you know, go find someone else to work with. This one, Burke sold it like he was dead. Um, I mean, definitely that time in OVW and, you know, in the WWE, great stuff there. My, I guess, you know, they made him look like an idiot at the end of the show. 
where, you know, he had the chance to win, but he decided to go attack suicide and just let Christopher Daniels climb out the hole and win the match in a very enjoyable match. Only flaw, like I said, was the production team, and that's not against the workers at all. It's obviously Keith Mitchell's fault and anyone else in the truck, so uh, that's just that. And, you know, we get we got at least one exciting match. A great way to get off the show, in my opinion, with the X Division guys. Uh, then we went to the next match. This was uh, Jethro Holiday trying to claim the $50,000 bonus that Dr. Stevie had put on Abyss. So we got a Abyss versus Dr. Stevie match. And this was, you know what, actually started off like a good old brawl. You know, that I, I like to see Jethro Holiday, you know, uh, go out there and brawl. He's That is what his style is, and he does it pretty well. I, I mean, he, I like him brawling, and he looks like a guy who should be a brawler. And, you know, they did that for a big good portion of the match, and it actually looked like it would be better than you thought it would be. It, of course, turns into a Abyss hardcore match where they get weapons and stuff. And one thing I'll make another complaint with TNA is they actually, in their first advertising said this is our hardcore show, every match is going to have hardcore implications, they really didn't hammer that point home. So when you see freaking Abyss go for a chair and um, uh, Jethro Holiday have a baton, you're like, well, shouldn't this be a DQ or something? I mean, why? You hammer that point home, TNA. I don't think they did a great job of that at all, hammering the point home. Uh, that this is, you know, a ha all hardcore pay-per-view where there's really no DQ in any of the matches. Uh, but overall, I thought this match was fine. It got pretty bad towards the end. Typical TNA Abyss match with with him. So, whatever. Abyss got the Black Hole Slam. I thought it went on a smidge too long. I thought Abyss should have hit the Black Hole Slam uh, maybe about five minutes before he did. But other than that, you know, this match was better than I thought it would be. And at the end of the match, Jethro Holiday just lays out Dr. Stevie, who uh, took a pretty nice little bump there. So that was fine. Moving along, we go to the next match. This was Rob Terry, or Big Rob Terry, versus uh, Hernandez for the briefcase, which has the heavyweight title shot. And, of course, no one wanted to see this match at all because Rob Terry is clueless in the ring. And it was booked great because, look, it was about 15 to 30 seconds of, you know, Hernandez coming out saying, like, you stole my briefcase. That's like stealing something from my house. You know, doing a number on the uh, Doug Williams and Brutus Magnus. And then, you know, coming out and getting all that momentum and just shoulder tacking Rob, Rob Terry, catching him off guard and getting the three count and his briefcase back. Fine. Perfect booking. Thank you, Jim Cornette. This is why you were such a great man in the wrestling business. Because who the fuck wanted to see Rob Terry in the ring? No one. They just threw it out there. I don't know why. Just to get Hernandez on pay-per-view. I'm completely against just putting someone you're trying to push on pay-per-view just for that purpose. Let him be in a program that's important. Rob Terry is just a guy, really, in the British Invasion and their muscle who rarely should be in the ring. I don't want him, really, to wrestle. But anyways... Uh, whatever. Then we went to the next match. This was the IWGP uh, Tag Team Championship match. The British Invasion defending against Beer Money Incorporated. This was a good match, I would say. Um, you know, Beer Money still the hottest thing in TNA. You know, in terms, I guess, of fan reaction, I didn't really come through actually on this pay per view. But in my opinion, they they're like still one of the most over acts in TNA. Um, I like this was another good match. I mean, nothing I really could hate on once again it's you know uh doug williams doing most of the work for the british invasion but you know what i'm still fine with that um you know magnus gets his spots in which are fine um they of course you know they did the kind of comedy spot where you just whip uh your opponents in the tree your partners in the tree of woe and they sent Bruce magnus in and you know get crotched him and doug williams's face and they fell on top of each other in the 69 him whatever you know the invasion got the heat and then, basically, it was kind of a wacky finish, I guess you could say. I really won't complain about this finish, though, where it was just uh, Eric Young coming in and uh, sliding a belt. I believe it was sliding a belt into, or it was the low blow finish here. The uh, James Storm got low blowed, and I believe Doug Williams or Bruce Magnus rolled up Storm, and they got the win to retain. Kind of shocked by that, since, you know, uh, Doug Williams, like I made mention in my previous video, has a working deal with Pro Wrestling Noah, and I guess can't technically work with new japan but my thoughts are well maybe you know doug williams can come over because new japan would like allow that since new japan and noah have a good relationship and they're working with tna maybe something of that nature that's just my feelings here um maybe they were like hey what the hell let's have the british invasion 
come over, you know. We all know that the history in, you know, World War Two with Britain and Japan. So, hey, what the hell? Why not maybe attempt to bring one? Maybe New Japan just completely changed their status on that. So, fine with that. And then we went to the uh, TNA Knockout Championship match. This was uh, Cody Diener and ODB versus uh, the champion Angelina Love and Velvet Sky. Really, this was a comedy match with what you thought it would be, and it was. I mean, I will say Cody Diener did some pretty funny things. You know, the I mean, I, I like Cody Diener. You know what? You know, at least they're not trying to make you take him as a serious character. They turned him into a comedy-type character, which, you know, is good because ODB as herself was a comedy character, but they kind of went too far with it, and she lost a lot of her momentum. Now with Cody Diener, I guess that helps rub off on her. Um, but, yeah, like, this was a comedy match, and... Um, <laughs> Basically, Code Diener molested everyone in there. Uh, uh, definitely laid a heavily spanking on Velvet Sky. I mean, her ass was actually red, like bright red. And, you know, that was just that. You know, Diener got the pin after making out with every single one of the beautiful people on uh, Velvet Sky after Velvet Sky got hit in the eyes with the hair mist or the hair spray or something, whatever that stuff is. And that was the finish, and I was gonna. I was just thinking, oh my god, what if she kicks out like the last pay per view? <laughs> but they didn't do that, thank God. Um, and uh, Diener got the win, and they announced ODB as champion. What? I wasn't aware of that. But then you know, at least Cody Diener walked off with the belt, and looks like he'll hold it up and probably have a match with I don't know either ODB or someone, maybe a gauntlet match. I don't know. I think you can do some pretty funny stuff with Cody Diener. And, you know, you can't say, oh, this is just stupid that TNA would do this. Look, WWE's done this a million times. So don't just go after TNA on that. Um, and then they tease the breaking up of the beautiful people, which I hope doesn't happen because I, I think the beautiful people are great for the knockout division. I mean, yeah, they're divas, but they're not diva diva stuff. And I don't know. I just hope they don't break it. I mean, you could maybe kick Madison Rain out, but don't break up Angelina and Velvet. They have some incredible chemistry there. Uh, moving along, we went to the X Division title match. It was uh, Homicide defending against Samoa Joe. This was a good match. It looked, it was going well, really well, before they just had him, uh, Joe, choke out Homicide, which sucks because, I mean, we all know these two can really work. Um, but I don't know, when these their last two matches, something just seems to be off. I mean, it was a little sloppy on their impact match. Some stuff was a little bit sloppy here, but I'm like not really going to complain. Um, people are saying, man, Joe really needs to lose some of the weight. He's actually trimmed down a bit since this character has been uh, given. So I'm not going to blame Joe on that. I think Joe's actually trimmed down a lot, like I said. So I'm not going to say that. Um... Homicide actually may want to trim down a couple pounds as well. If you noticed him from like a couple years ago to now, man, this man is packed on a hell of a lot of weight. So that's just that. Overall, like I said, this match was good, but it, it could have been something more. I th don't think TNA put that much effort in. They're like, yeah, what the hell? Joe's going to win the belt, so let's just let them have a match. Um, the crowd was more into Joe than Homicide, which I don't know what you think of that, but I guess that's the way that the, the Impact fans will always remember Joe as being, you know, great joe i guess and they're not into this character so they're just trying to hey well let's remember the other joe so we'll cheer for him so that's just that and the mafia gets another belt and whatever um i'm actually you know what not that upset about samoa joe being champion because the next pay-per-view is taking on christopher daniels and what should be another great match and this match was going really good it's just they cut it off too short so that's neither homicide or samoa joe's fault uh that would be the people who booked that match Anyways, moving along, the next match was the TNA Tag Team Championship. It was Booker T and Scott Steiner versus Team 3D. Match by far had the best crowd reaction. I don't know why, really. I really don't. I th I, they're, they're into Team 3D. Team 3D's putting on some good matches as of late. I don't know why, either. They get the lo most time, and I guess, you know, they're putting up good stuff. This match did drag on a lot, in my opinion. I will say that it dragged on a little bit too long, and it's another Booker T and Scott Steiner match that has a dumb, wacky finish and goes too long. Um, basically, you know, they brawled in the crowd like you have to do on every TNA pay-per-view. That is law. There must be one match in the crowd, and since Abyss didn't get to do it, Team 3D had the right to. Um, this match was there. It was there in spots. It was exciting in spots as well. 
Um, but yeah, uh, the finish was just dumb, in my opinion. They did this, they did this thing where they had uh, Team 3D hit the 3D on Booker T, but then at the same time, after that, uh, Scott Steiner rolled up Bubba Ray, and the refs, two refs, counted at the same time. Yeah, they kept adding rules as you went, which I'm a, not a fan of in any promotion where they just changed it from. You know, oh, this is a tag title match, and oh, it's an ODQ match, oh, it's a false count anywhere match. By the way, we added two referees. Do we really need two referees? Really? And they did this thing where, oh, they weren't sure who got the pinfall first, so they hit instant replay when this did not happen on the last pay-per-view, when you had your women's championship in a situation where the referee easily could have looked at the replay and reversed the decision that did not happen so why did they decide to do it here and now they every other finish that they do that is wacky we will be like well you instant replay go there please and we did not get that in the other matches but here we did and they just ruled that oh apparently steiner got the fall first i don't know why but okay i think they could have just said look the fall was too close let's just go tight like you know in baseball tie goes to the runner Champions automatically retain in that situation. We probably are going to get another rematch between the two. And if they can tr trim this match shorter or just keep it a regular tag, um, I think we're in for a better uh, run with this match. Um, then we go into the next match. This was Mick Foley versus Kevin Nash. Match easily blew my uh, expectations away. As I liked what they did with it, they... Both knew that they're not going to put on a great clinic in there, so let's just take some shortcuts, but not take too many of the shortcuts. And I loved how they were, you know, Foley did the chair, you know, elbow drop to the chair uh, that Nash then put up in his eye, and they really sold the eye well. I mean, I haven't seen Foley do a blade job like that since about SummerSlam 06 when he took on Ric Flair, or, or even his IWA death matches in Japan. Um... But he did a great job selling that, and then, you know, eventually Foley came back and gave Nash a uh, slamming into the steps, and Nash did a blade job. I liked how they sold that well, like, oh my god, you know, these guys are taking it well, and, you know, they, the blade job worked in this situation. I think what also helped it was that there was blood on the camera, so it added to, wow, these guys just don't really like each other. So I thought that, that kind of worked well, in my opinion. Um, you know, I guess the crowd wasn't that much into it because I guess they were just expecting it to be bad and I guess they, they didn't change their perception, even though they got a pretty good match out of it, but that's just my opinion there. Finish was completely botched by Keith Mitchell again on this show as they had uh, Tracy Brooks come down, fully knocked her off, and I don't even know how fucking Kevin Nash won this match, but he did. So Nash gets the Legends title again. And whatever, you know, match is better than I thought it would be, which is a great credit to these men. Um, you know, Foley for sure, realizing, like, I can't work that well anymore. Let's just take some shortcuts. And definitely Kevin Nash, because that's what you got to do with the Kevin Nash in these situations. And Kevin Nash, as of late, has been putting on pretty good matches in TNA. I will say that. When he's in there, he's putting on decent stuff. You know, AJ, he tried. You know, the match with Joe, he put him over, made him look dominant but you know that's two years too late but still he's out there trying and i can't take that away from kevin nash at all and then of course we go to the main event of the show it was the tna championship on the line in a triple threat it was sting or kurt angle versus sting versus matt morgan match was okay really um you know they tried they did this thing where they had uh, kurt angle work with Matt Morgan because, you know, he promised Matt Morgan a spot in the Mafia if he helped them retain. And then, of course, they did this pretty kind of genius spot where, you know, uh, Angle put the rope down and Morgan fell through and he's like, look, Sting was going to drop kick you. I saved you. And they both got hot at each other. And then they did this thing where you think, okay, they're going to do an injury angle because Morgan got the carbon footprint on Angle. Angle was selling his shoulder like, man, my, my shoulder's broken. My collarbone's broken. You know, something there. And they just went on with the match where, you know, uh, Sting almost beat Morgan. Morgan got a pinfall on uh, Sting. Angle then comes up from, like, the dead and pulls him out and gets the pin on uh, Sting. So, wow. They put the belt on Kurt Angle, who really needs to not have that belt and, you know, go away to deal with his stuff. Um, he'll be at TVs. So he got his court date pushed back to September 15th. So... I don't know. I don't really agree with the decision. 
Um, but in the long run, what else could you have done? I don't know. You definitely could have put it on someone. I thought for sure after Kurt got the pinfall, they're going to have Homicide come, or Hernandez come out, cash in the briefcase, and, you know, do what he did to Rob Terry, bum rush him so Kurt could take some time off. But Kurt retains, and, well, we go from here. We'll see what happens on the t uh, impact tapings, and I don't know. Kurt definitely needs to take some time off television, in my opinion. But other than that, the show was better than I thought. Definitely a thumbs in the middle show. Kind of an end part drag. Your big matches drag. I will give it some credit um, in like your Nash Foley situations. Um, opener was good. Uh, you know, we got a comedy match as you expected it to be a comedy match. Main event was not good really at all. Um, but other than that, thumbs in the middle. I can't say it was thumbs down or definitely not even in the thumbs up category, but still better than I thought it would be. Moving along to Strike Force here. Uh, very good show, as I said. This was such an enjoyable show. Um, there was apparently a very devastating knockout in the one of the prelim fights. I believe that fight was the uh, James Terry versus Zach Boussier. It was basically um, a Sean Sal Salmon versus Rashad Evans knockout. Uh, which I would like to see Strike Force put up somewhere, but anyways, uh, anyways, this show started out with the heavyweight con uh, heavyweight bout between Mike Kyle and Fabricio Verdum. Very happy they put this one on the main card. As look, you're trying to build up Fabricio Verdum as a contender now for Fedor. So very happy they made the decision to move the Jay Heron versus Jesse Taylor fight, which is no longer a title fight, down to the undercard. And that, apparently, that fight sucked. So. They move up for Doom and Kyle, and you know what? That was a interesting fight. You know, it wasn't completely Fabricio dominating Kyle. Um, Mike Kyle actually almost had an armbar, which caught me off guard for a while. It's like, wow, what if Mike Kyle actually submits for Doom? Dana White will be doing cartwheels in his uh, room in Vegas. That didn't happen. Uh, Verdum actually just transferred out of it. Did a beautiful transition and locked in a guillotine. Got the submission very quickly. And you know what? He cut a pretty nice little promo afterwards, you know, uh, kind of proving that, you know, he doesn't have the best English, but he has decent enough English to talk. So I, I enjoyed that very much. So and I thought the thing that was very interesting about that fight was we had the uh, Japanese referee Yuji Shimada, who apparently wanted to referee the uh, next fight, which was the uh, interim uh, Strike Force lightweight championship between Mitsuhiro Ishida and Gilbert Melendez, but the California State Athletic Commission said no to this one, uh, which in a way was good because, like, say, uh, maybe they, they feared that, you know, the Japanese ref would favor the Japanese fighter, but anyways, that's a different situation. And, hap and at least he got to referee a fight, so that kind of shows that Dream and Strike Force are working well together, I guess. If they're going to exchange referees, cool. That's something interesting in the... And there's actually more that I'll get on in a second after I review the show. But anyways, we went to the interim lightweight title fight. Easily a great fight, in my opinion. A runner-up for fight of the night, in my opinion. It was just such a great back-and-forth battle. Um, I think Ishida's reason he lost and didn't look like, you know, he should, he had only a couple weeks' notice. And, you know, you're fighting in a different culture, different rules apply, and then you have to come over to North America, and especially the state of California, one of the most strict states that sanctions mixed martial arts. Different circumstances there. But, you know, he showed that he was a true warrior. He took some devastating punches. Devastating punches. Um, he tried to, a lot of takedowns. Melendez showed great takedown defense. And was able to uh, get a submission on late in the third round after I thought he'd finished off Ishida in the second round with some vicious strikes. Um, Ishida, like I said, showed a lot of heart. And got the got submitted, unfortunately. But you know what? I think you bring Ishida back. Put him against uh, someone else. I don't know who else, but put him up in there. You know, he, get him some more marketability. As, you know, a tough Japanese fighter who gave, you know, your interim champion a run for his money. Now, the thing that I find very laughable, in my opinion, is that Ishida and his camp have filed a complaint to the California State Athletic Commission about Gilbert Melendez greasing. Seriously. No. Not at all. I seriously don't believe Gilbert Melendez did. You know, every takedown Ishida had um, was stuffed. Basically, it was just great takedown defense using a strong sprawl. And, you know, just using the, the great wrestling that Melendez has to get out of the circumstances. You know, there were some good ground battles in this fight, too. Very exciting stuff there. And 
hopefully Melendez gets his shot at the lightweight title that Josh Thompson holds. I mean, what this is the second or third time this fight has not happened because of Josh Thompson's injured ankle or toe or whatever the hell it was. Then we went to the next fight. The Strike Force light heavyweight title was on the line. It was Arneto Babalu Sobral defending against Gagard Musasi. And man, did Musasi look like make Sobral look like he didn't even belong fighting anymore. Or didn't even look like a championship material of a fighter. He went out there and blitzed him. You know, so Brawl kind of tried to take this one to the ground. Uh, Musasi stuffed it, and when it was on the ground, it's Musasi in control. And then, you know, they got up against the cage, and Musasi just rained down some dominant punches that had Sobral stiffened up, kind of like uh, Vitor Belfort had Matt Lindland at the uh, Affliction uh, Day of Reckoning show uh, earlier this year. So it was pretty scary for a couple seconds. Uh, Sobral was fine afterwards, which is a, a good thing. But, man, that Musasi, that's going to be a dominant champion. I don't see anyone beating him for the lightweight title for a very long time in, in Strike Force. He just made Sobral look so bad. So now he's going to probably go over to Japan and win the open weight tournament. He's, in my opinion, going to beat Sokuju. And it's either Minimo Man or Hongman Choi. Take Choi or Minimo Man down. Sub. Easy. Easy pick for that one, from, in my opinion. And then we went to the main event. It was Gina Carano versus Chris Cyborg. And this felt like... This felt like a Shamrock Ortiz, a Liddell Couture, Liddell Ortiz, Brock uh, Couture type fight. This felt that big. And you know what? In reality, it was. This fight had a lot of hype going into it, and it really did deliver. This was some of the most exciting uh, four minutes and 59 seconds you're going to ever see in mixed martial arts. The women bring on incredible, exciting fights, and this is no exception. This is not an exception. Um, to me, just before the fight started, Gina looked very intimidated by uh, Chris Cyborg. And, you know, who's going to blame her, really? Chris Cyborg is one of the most intimidating women in the world. I think she could beat some of the uh, featherweights in the WEC, in my opinion. But, anyways, as this fight got underway, you know, uh, Cyborg came out with her typical style of, like, absolutely bum-rushing you and delivering some great shots where you think, oh, my God, Gina's done. And then the fight went to the ground, and she put on this great heel hook, and I'm like, okay, Gina's done. It's over this quickly. Gina showed some great resilience, reversed it, um, and they got back to a stand-up. And I think from that point, Gina's like, I can hang. And you know what? She did for a while, because there was times when Cyborg would try for a takedown. Gina ends up in full mount. And all, like she could have probably ground and pounded Cyborg. Maybe I don't know, to a stoppage, but to a close stoppage at, at, for sure. And she just let it up. I don't know why she thought she could beat uh, Cyborg standing up when she was clearly losing the uh, end of that. And I don't know. I Seriously, that's the one thing I question. Um, the fight went to the ground again, and it looked like Cyborg has got another great inverted Kimura. Toronto gets out of it, and then before you know it, you know they're up against the cage, and Cyborg just pounds her to death. And a lot of people are saying, man, Josh Rosenthal stopped this fight. Wait, you know, uh, unfortunate time with one second left, but look, this is MMA. He really... You should know, look at the clock, but in a situation like that, you're really not paying attention to the clock. You, you're you paying attention to the safety of a fighter, especially, you know, not just saying, oh my, not because it's Gina Corona, but anyone, anyone in that situation, you do the same thing. So uh, Josh Rosenthal made a good stoppage, in my opinion, I'm not going to complain. You know, she really wasn't defending herself intelligently or fighting back or even attempting to make, you know, herself get up or out of danger. You know, if she even, you know, threw a couple strikes back, I don't think this would have stopped me going to the second round and it's a whole new fight again. Um, but she didn't. Cyborg wins and I definitely see uh, Strike Force now having to bring Tara LaRosa in because to me, Tara LaRosa is the best out there to beat uh, Cyborg. Um... I definitely don't think it's going to ever main event again, or for a very long time, main event uh, Strike Force shows, but that's just my opinion on the Strike Force stuff with Dream, which, you know, they had the Dream president there. And I thought some of the stuff that they were talking about was pretty interesting, as Dream decided, hey, let's get maybe definite talent exchanges, you know, potential title fights over there. Um, and I thought the most interesting thing was, a Strike Force show from Japan. I don't know if it'll happen on CBS. Maybe you can tape it, you know, on a, a Monday and air it on the weekend. Um, I think that could work. 
or or I think best probably be Showtime and have it the same day. You know, do it on tape delay. But I think that that brings a really interesting deal there. I mean, I know Strike Force may get you know Shinya Yoki, uh, guys like of that caliber. I think would be great for Strike Force. You know, after hopefully they clear up this mess with uh, Josh Thompson and uh, Gilbert Melendez, have them finally get their title fights. But other than that, uh, you know, very intriguing stuff. There not that much came out of the press conference, but still. Really, I think that's a very interesting thing. Uh, hopefully, they can get it done. And, yeah, hopefully, you know, you leave your feedback for both Teen A Hard Justice as well as the Strike Force show, uh, Corona vs. Cyborg. And, yeah, anyways, thanks for watching. Anyways, that's it, that's it for me. I'm out. Peace.